You're listening to Speaking of Faith with Bishop Dee Dee Duncan Proby of the Episcopal Diocese of Central New York. I'm Rachel Ravalette for Romcom, and we're glad you're here. Hello, welcome to this podcast, Speaking of Faith. My name is Dee Dee Duncan Proby. I'm the Episcopal Bishop of the Diocese of Central New York. That's Canada to Pennsylvania and Utica to Elmira and all the beautiful people and places in between. I'm so glad to be joined today by Kevin and Becky, who are both uh, trans persons, and to hear from their perspective. You've heard us talk on this podcast before about speaking of our faith and inclusion and dignity, but this is a great opportunity for all of us to learn from and with and be allies to Kevin and Becky. And so here we are with uh, Adam. Rachel is away. And uh, Adam is part of our staff as well. And so I'm glad to have all of y'all uh, here today. And especially Kevin and Becky, thank you for being part of this podcast. A pleasure. Um, as you heard, the speaking of faith is the intention of this podcast to talk about our faith as persons. And I would be interested to hear from each of you kind of your lived experience of being a trans person in the church and ways that has gone well and ways that that has been a challenge. Um, but if you don't mind sharing some of your journey uh, that has led you to this place, um, that would be great for our listeners. Okay. Um, I'm Becky, and um, I am a priest in the Diocese of Central New York. And um, I've had you know mixed, mixed uh, experience with the church. Um, when I decided to transition about eight years ago, um, the bishop uh, at the time, Skip Adams, was very supportive. However, the church I was at um, was not. And um, I ended up losing my position at that church. Um, I thought my career was over, to be honest. Um, happily, um, I am now at the church, uh, St. Peter's Episcopal Church at Bainbridge, which has an emphasis, a focus on um, open, affirming church for LGBTQ folks. Uh, for them, it was no problem. Um, it was uh, a, a really good experience. I love being there. And um, I am so happy that I was able to continue my career as a priest. And um, I am enjoying the people there. I'm enjoying... You know, we don't even think about trans or my being trans anymore. It's just part of my existence. Um, the only time I get concerned is when I hear of other um, trans folks who are not being treated well. I'm particularly concerned about uh, some of the new regulations in Florida and in Idaho, especially around kids that uh, would like to deal with it being transgender um, and you know it's, it's been even beyond just saying you can't you know transition now it's you can't get care um, I'm very concerned about uh, some of the bathroom issues um, at this point if I had to walk into a men's room as the person I am um, one I don't think I would be welcome in the men's room um, and uh, I would be in some danger, I think. Um, so I, uh, you know, I, I definitely have some concerns and fears still, um, but for the most part, I've been treated well, um, both at the diocesan level and uh, at, at my parish. Good. So take it, Kevin. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm a, I'm a lay person. Um, I go to <laughs> Episcopal Church in <laughs> and uh, I belong to a, another denomination that was not accepting at all and it was it was a struggle. Um, I dealt with things such as um, a couple attempted suicides. Uh, you know that's a that's a big concern for in the transgender community is, uh, amount of uh, suicides. It's, I think it's like at 40%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's pretty much one one out of every two people. 
And, you know, I don't want to see uh, another transgender young person have to make that decision because uh, certain um, places in the government says it's not appropriate. Um, I think um, uh, because of my struggles, I can see that uh, the benefits of a starting transition early uh, rather than late in life. I mean, I didn't transition until I was 61, which mm. was, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing to think about, um, to see my life from what it was, um, uh, before till now is, uh, is amazing. Um, I think I had a, um, uh, you know, I struggled with, with being accepted by God for the longest time. And I think belonging to an accepting denomination has helped me do that. And having gone to spiritual direction and, you know, speaking with uh, people, I was able to finally say to God, uh, do, do you accept me? Do you love me? And I was able to receive that message that God is a loving and caring God and does love me for who I am. Thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, Kevin, knowing you just makes my heart hurt to think of you not being able to access knowing that God loves you. And um, and I want to make sure that we name, I mean, I talk a lot about the God loving you as your, your created being. And I really believe, and this is where I could be very wrong, and you are the experts, correct me, but I believe that God has created you as you are in this present form, not like some sort of weird yeah. no one should transition, but actually that this is part of God's uh, belovedness is is to to demonstrate and to be part of you becoming your full self. Um, and so part of transitioning is you being whole as a whole person and loved as you wholly are. And so I appreciate you sharing that. For our listeners, whatever your faith tradition may be, and especially whatever you may have been taught around uh, issues or, and I hate to say issues, so I'll take that back, uh, around transgender or LBGTQ plus acceptance in the church, which is an issue. So I think that was right. I was going the right direction. Um, that you are loved by God. And so especially to those folks that Kevin's talking about, the 40% who may be suicidal, that um, you are indeed loved and wanted and cherished. And that message uh, definitely needs to get out there. So thank you both. Um so you brought up, you mentioned the legislation and about bathrooms and that. How does that, I mean, we're, we're living in New York and we're talking about Idaho, but how does that impact you um, and, and the community and especially in the church as we hear about the legislation in other places? What is that like for you? I think it creates a certain amount of fear. Um, I hesitate to travel certain places in our, my own country. Um, and I know Florida, for instance, has a, a law saying you have to use the bathroom of your birth gender, at least in government buildings. Um, that's, um, uh, talk about a dignity issue. I mean, that's a huge one. Yes. Um, I think we try to understand where people are trying to come from with this it is very difficult. Um, the other thing I can say is that uh, we tend to fear what we don't understand. But we tend to fear what has um, challenged um, our assumptions throughout our, our, our growing up. Um, I was never suicidal, but I could understand it. Because um, there was this, you know, give and take between... I think the possibility of staying who I was and the possibility of transitioning into something new and not really knowing what that was going to be like. It was a step into the unknown. Um, I was very lucky. I had a wife who was still my wife. Um, and that was, that was key for me, I think, to surviving this. Um, but only 25% of marriages survive the transition. 
It's like fifty percent of marriages survive anyway. So oh. it's not, <laughs> as bad as it sounds. <laughs> uh, that's a different uh, program, though. That's a <laughs> I know, I know. Um, uh, so, yeah, it does create some fear, even though I know I'm not going to be touched by it too intimately here in New York. And I do appreciate it's one of the reasons I'm here in New York, to be honest. Yeah. Um, um, I've often been asked, why don't you move back to Wisconsin, where I, where I used to be? And uh, I would just would not feel safe there. I am not, I don't know the bishop there very well. I'm not sure that I would even be accepted and be able to still be a priest there. Um, so that's, uh, you know, those fears continue. Uh, they're kind yeah. of underground a little bit because I am safe here, but it does limit my travel. It limits um, some of the things I, I can do outside of the state. Yeah, I I used to live in North Dakota, and in order to get um, uh, you know find a uh, group of transgender people, I had to go over to the over the state line to go to Minnesota, which is a little bit more liberal than North Dakota. Yeah. And North Dakota is another state that is having uh, enacting these uh, laws for young people. Yeah, so. Um, but just to see the difference between states, and uh, that's also why I'm in New York because it's a it's a safe safer place to be. Mm. What? How? Um, what would you like for that your allies and especially obviously in our church to know about how to support you? I mean, what are some ways that their church community can be supportive in this time? Well, my church has always been uh, supportive. When I uh, when I first came out, uh, the first people I told were the members of the vestry. Um, besides my uh, my brother, um, and I had told my brother, you know, several years earlier. But um, the first people I really came out to was was my church, and they accepted me uh, right away. I mean, there's every once in a while they. Uh, call me she by accident, and then they apologize all over the place for it. But you know, you know, I can live with that. They they knew me as female before. They knew me as being married before. Um, you know, they knew my husband. Um, you know, it was just. Um, but they've always been really accepting and uh, helpful to me and open. I, I think the big thing for all churches is simply to be accepting to and loving um, for the people we are. Um, our transgender status is only a piece of who we are. Obviously, I'm a priest. Um, I'm married. I have kids. I have hobbies. I have you know other interests. Um, gender is an important part of who I am. But it's not all of who I am. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the kind of the basis. Uh, beyond that is, um, you know, when somebody does misgender or attacks, that that people will stand up for it, stand up against it. Um, and you know, if they're really involved when there are transgender issues that come up, that they would. Um, be an ally in in uh, whether it's you know <laughs> testifying or supporting uh, support groups, um, <laughs> you know just just to be there. Mm -hmm. um, the other main part might be education mm -hmm. that that they need to understand what this is all about. Because um, if more they understand, the less they'll fear it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe even educating other folks kind of in that same way. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, to be, to advocate, to learn, to support, I think those are the things that the church can do. I am grateful to be in a church that does that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, um, well, and I can say, you know, I've, uh, 
want to acknowledge to the listeners and anyone who doesn't know, um, Becky is a priest in my diocese, and one of my great joys is being your bishop. And um, you, you're on, and she's a leader in the, in this diocese. You're you're part of uh, all that we do and enrich that. And Kevin as well. Um, you know, y'all are part of, of this community and in a really contributing way and an essential way. And so that is a great joy to be part of this. Now, what do you think people don't understand? Um, you know, I think when people hear about these laws, they don't quite get it, especially around, you, you mentioned the sports. I think there's a lot of misnomers around uh, uh, inclusion in sports. Um, but can you say more about what you see as the, some of the misconceptions people have around some of these wider issues where they don't really get uh, what it's actually like? people who are trans? Um, well, one thing I do know is that once you start taking the hormones, um, I've lost a fair amount of strength that I used to have. Um, I don't, not that I was ever a great athlete anyway, but uh, I can't imagine competing against guys and being able to do well. Um so, you know, the very facts of transition, I think, are uh, change change our physical nature. Obviously, uh, the other thing about supporting for the church, and I think um, I'm now that I'm established as to who I am, it's not such a problem. The issue comes mostly at transitions, and again, as Kevin noted, you know, people knew me as somebody else, and so. It does take a effort on both of our parts to accommodate to that. Um, also to recognize that it's a very destabilizing time, um, especially for kids. You know, um, I certainly recognize that, you know, minor kids need a lot of care, a lot of psychological care, a lot of support. Um, and um, to have them being demonized because of who they are is simply, to me, inexcusable mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and cruel. Um, so, you know, there's obviously lots of, of bullying that can go on in schools. Um, th those especially the people that the church and other folks can help support. Absolutely. To me, I mean, from my vantage point, this is a dignity issue in, in the truest sense. We actually take vows in the Episcopal Church. And again, for our listeners, whatever your faith tradition may be, we've ta I've talked quite a lot about uh, our baptismal covenant. And there are episodes at the beginning of this podcast you can listen to. But uh, we actually take a vow that we will respect the dignity of every person. And in the Episcopal Church, that vow um, to me, holds us accountable for how we treat one another and how we believe one another. And as you're talking about with transitioning in that time and the destabilization, um, I think the church has a crucial role to play because, as you said earlier, Kevin, uh, to believe that God could love you um, took such a very long time in your life because when you're talking yeah. about transitioning at 61, and then I'm sort of doing the math thinking, good heavens, you spent quite a number of years feeling like God didn't love you. Uh -huh. And you putting that together with what Becky is saying, um, it just, I think it should burden all of our hearts that we make sure that trans, you know, young people uh, know that there is a place where they can be loved and where they're affirmed and accepted. Um, now you were talking, Becky, about medical care. I'm not sure that everyone always knows what that means. Uh, medical care for people who are uh, trans. Uh, can you say more, either one of you say more about uh, medical care and the unique needs that need to be uh, recognized and understood? Sure. Again, um, for, I transitioned at 67, so I beached out there, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you Not know. a race you want to win, but go ahead. No, but, but Kevin and, and I both grew up in an age where 
it just didn't exist. No. I, I had no idea. I had no way to label how I was feeling for many years. And then at some point, it was like, well, you know, I'm established as to, you know, my male identity. How do I go about, you know, going away from that? Uh, medically, um, a little bit different for kids versus adults. Uh, for me, I went on uh, spironolactone early on, which is a uh, know, testosterone inhibitor, and, um, and eventually on to estradiol on a regular basis. And I still take that on a regular basis. Um, and um, for kids, and so I think it's they I think it's spironolactone as well. But they call it a uh, puberty blocker, and the idea is that. Um, before secondary sex characteristics start establishing themselves, that you can delay that onset and give the kid more time to, you know, really determine is this what they want to do mm -hmm. before they take a step that is irreversible. Um, and um, and even that part is being made illegal. In some mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. um, the other part, of course, is the psychological support. And before I could transition, I had to get approval of um, a psychologist. Um, actually, before I did that, I went to a, a, a counseling center. Kind of familiar. I kind of said, "Well, if I'm not trans." Let me help me find ways to deal with these feelings. Right. And um, of course, they really helped establish that, yeah, I was trans. So, but I would, I, I would have gone either way at that point. So, there's probably a lot of psychological care that has to happen, which is uh, maybe a little less straightforward than the medical plans. Um, yeah, those right. are kind of established. Um, I'm not sure as much for female to male. Maybe Kevin should probably talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I go, um, I give myself uh, testosterone injections every week. Um, I've had um, what uh, transgender people call top surgery. That's when you have uh, a double mastectomy. So I had that done uh, a couple of years ago. Um but I, I receive my ongoing care uh, at the uh, Inclusive Health Center that's at um, Upstate Hospital in Syracuse. And my doctor is able to especially uh, uh, treat me as, uh, as an individual. And it's a, it's a, it's a good place to go uh, to get care. Yeah, I, and a safe I go place. I go to the Gender Wellness Center in Oneonta, which is outstanding. Um, I know some people have had real difficulties finding medical care that will deal with their um, gender properly. Um, more and more medical institutions, though, are asking, you know, what is, what's your gender? What is your preferred pronouns? Uh, that sort of thing. Um, but you know, a lot of physicians don't have a lot of experience with transgender folks, so it's good to find physicians that know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, um, I really appreciate talking with both of you and the opportunity for all of us to learn um, and be uh, allies with. I mean, I wish there were a stronger word. Um, somebody's accomplice, somebody told me accomplice, but I think that in this time, um, and I will say, I want to be very clear about this. I think it's our responsibility as people who love Jesus to love our neighbors as ourselves, to, to be compassionate, to respect dignity. And um, I have been saying, in fact, on Sunday, y'all love hearing this, but my uh, conversation when I go to churches now, I bring this up because of um, recent events to talk about it's our responsibility to speak out and to make sure that people know they are loved by God and affirmed by God. And we don't have to understand or even totally get it, 
to know that we are called to be people who proclaim that love and live it out in action. And so our commitment in this diocese um, is to be partners in that, to respect the dignity of each person, to affirm their belovedness, and hopefully uh, even to get genders correct from time to time as best we can. And um, and I will confess, you know, I'm still growing in the day, but I'm getting better at it. I think as we go along, we, you know, learn and grow, hopefully, and get more uh, strong in that. Is mm-hmm. there anything that has, that has come to your mind that you would really particularly like the listeners to know uh, in this time? Is there anything that would be kind of your closing thoughts? Well, there, there are places that will support trans rights. There's the Center for Transgender Equality, um, which is a very good organization. And the Human Rights Council is is another one, um, which I support. Um, so you can support things financially. Um, mm-hmm. And they are fighting f- to deal with some of these outrageous laws that are being formulated. Mm-hmm. So that's that's very good. And um, uh, Kevin, is there anything, any closing thoughts that you have? No, just uh, just to uh, keep uh, preaching preaching that love of Jesus to everybody, uh, to know that they're loved and accepted. Very good. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, it's been our, my great honor for you to come and talk with us. And uh, for those who are listening, if you find that you are needing support or help, I uh, encourage you to reach out to a trusted friend or a counselor. Um, in the Episcopal Church is our intention to affirm and support people that, you know, I want to be clear that some churches are, we're all on a learning curve. Some churches aren't quite there yet. Some are, but in the diocese, we are here to support in whatever way we can. Uh, there's some, been some, uh, resources that have been mentioned in the podcast. So we encourage you to reach out and most of all, know that God loves you, that God is uh, with you and that we are here to respect and love one another. May you be blessed and know God's love in your life. And we'll talk soon. Take good care. Thanks for joining us. Speaking of Faith with Bishop Dee Dee is a production of the Episcopal Diocese of Central New York. Our theme music is by Fleece Mob, and it's called A Bird in Hand. We use it with permission. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast through your favorite podcasting app so that you can be the first to know when new episodes are available. If you like what you've heard here, please leave us a rating and review. If you don't like what you've heard here, we're sure you're still a wonderful person, but maybe don't leave us a review? Just kidding. We love honest feedback and questions. You can connect with us online between episodes at cnyepiscopal.org backslash podcast and on social media at CNY Episcopal. Blessings to you, friends. <laughs>